today. Uh, do we have any announcements? I do have a couple myself. But, uh, we had an administrative council meeting last Sunday to discuss the matter of wearing masks and we have decided to continue to wear them at all times during the service, even when we're speaking or singing. We will revisit the matter later on this summer and uh, see what kind of progress and decisions we've made then. So thank you so much for that. Okay, under joys and concerns, I do have a message here uh, about Marshall McDonald. He fell yesterday. Uh, he didn't break anything, but he had uh, scrapes and severe bruising. And Maisie is here today. Thank you so much. His daughter and Gussie's daughter, she'll be singing for us today for his birthday tomorrow. And thank you so much. And please keep Marshall and everyone else on our prayer list in your prayers. Okay, if y'all could rise, please, and join me in the call to worship. Let us praise God the Creator. Let us worship God the Savior. Let us experience God the Spirit. Please join me for the opening prayer. God, who created the world, Jesus, the Son, given for the world, Holy Spirit, ever-present in the world, be with us in our worship that we may know the fullness of the Holy One. As God lives in triune community, so may we live in communion with God and each other. Amen. The hymn of praise today is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, found in your hymnal on page 64. you'll please continue to stand and join with me in the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
you know that, uh, Major? Um, I don't think I do. Can you sing that for us? It's in if, I, if I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look it up while we're going okay. through the service. Right. That'd be good. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, Major, Kenny and Major. Yes, thank you, Maisie, for blessing us with your beautiful voice today. At this time, I'd like to uh, give an acknowledgement of our tithes and offerings. We do have our plates available every Sunday at the doors of the church, um, or you can also send them to the office. Thank you. Uh, please join me in the doxology now. If you'll continue to stand while we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Well, Charles Stanley, he, he, he teaches sitting and standing, and watched him on television. Uh, John Wesley, the founder of, of Methodism, uh, he preached uh, seating in a sitting position. So I guess maybe I can preach uh, on one leg because <laughs> that's the only one I got good. <laughs> but uh, it's good to be with you again. And uh, you know, I was asked to come three weeks ago and uh, I prepared a message, and uh, then I found out that it was Communion Sunday. So I had to put that message away and do a new communion, a new service for communion. And then I was asked to come again. Uh, let's say you had someone last week, and it was week before last. You had that was week before last. You had someone. And I thought I was coming and found out I wasn't coming. And so I was asked to come this Sunday, and I picked the, the sermon up that I prepared three weeks ago, and it's Memorial Sunday. Well, I, I, everybody that served in the middle of the church, would you please stand? My, am I the only one? Well, I served from 1954 to 1956, two years. And it was an honor to serve my country. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you're welcome. And it's an honor to uh, mention those who uh, gave their lives and those who are veterans this day. If you, I can't get, I got these old glasses. Uh, Ralph gave them to me. You, know, you see Ralph Hendricks so, uh, in our own colloquialism, they ain't good no more. <laughs> okay. So I'll be reading, uh, I'll read, I, can, I think I can see good enough. Uh, the scripture from uh, First, First Kings that we'll be reading, if, if, if I may preface this, it's, his scripture is about a man called Naaman. He was a commander-in-chief in the Syrian army under uh, uh, Ben-Hadad, who was at this particular time uh, the ruler in Persia and Syria. And uh, the, the commander was well favored by the uh, uh, ruler of that day, and 
He honored him very much, and he was a popular man, man of valor. Uh, but he had problem. He had leprosy. Now, leprosy is, you know, is where you have nodules on your body and lacerations on your body and deformities of the body. And uh, he, he, he was an ill man, even though he was a, a great, powerful man. And there was a little maiden that they had captured from Israel that served his wife. And she said, if, if only my master were in the land of Samaria, there's a great prophet there and he'd be healed. And so she shared that with him and with the, with the king of Syria, Ben Hadad. And so he sent him down to Samaria with, 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 with many changes of clothing, many shekels of silver and gold uh, to see the man of God. And the king of Israel heard this and he feared uh, something was going to be wrong. But nevertheless, uh, the king of, 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 uh, of Persia assured him it wouldn't. So he goes there, and this is where we see the scripture. And so it was when the, uh, the man of uh, God, Elisha, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes because he feared uh, that he said to the king, saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and, she sh and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And then Naaman went with his uh, horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger out to him, saying, Go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became serious, uh, furious, and, and he went away and he said, Indeed, I said uh, to myself, he will surely come out uh, to me and stand and call the name of the God, Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, uh, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and he went away in a rage. Childish. And the servants came near and spoke to him and said, uh, My father of the, uh, of the prophet, he had told you to do something. If he had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? But uh, here, how much more excuse me, uh, how uh, much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean. And so Naaman went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan River uh, according to the saying of the man of God. And the flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. And then for the New Testament scripture reading, if you'd turn over there with me, Please, to the uh, Gospel of Luke. And we read, uh, beginning in the seventh chapter, verses 24 through 34. And when the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitude, that is, Jesus concerning John. And he said, what did you go out to, in the wilderness to see? A, a reed shaken by the wind? Well, what did you go out to see? A, a, a man clothed in, in soft garments? Uh, uh, indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and, and live in luxury are, are in king's court. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, who will, you, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those who have been uh, born of women, there is not a, prof, not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he is least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. And then all the people heard him 
Even the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel and, uh, of God for themselves, uh, not having been baptized by him, by John. And the Lord said, And to what generation shall this, in what, in what then shall I liken the men of this generation? What shall I say? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, uh, We played the flute for you, and you would not dance. We mourn for you, and you would not weep. That's an interesting analogy. For when John the Baptist came, neither uh, eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has uh, uh, come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Then one of the Pharisees asked him uh, to eat with him, and Jesus went to the first house and sat down and ate with him. And behold, a woman, excuse me, this is not in the scripture, behold, a woman uh, in the city who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster of fragrant oil, and she stood at his feet weeping and began to wash his feet with her hair. May God add his blessings to the reading and hearing and understanding of his word. May we pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of thy heart be acceptable in thy sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this may not be a particular popular message this morning, but it is the truth. And the truth always prevails. Uh, have you ever heard the statement, or perhaps uh, uttered it yourself to someone else, you're the most childish person I've ever seen? You ever heard that? Have you uttered that? Jesus pointed out that there were some adults, some aspects of adults that are like children, always uh, disagreeing. People uh, to whom no matter what was suggested, uh, they didn't want to do it, and no matter what was offered, they could find fault in it. You know, it's always, not only in the church, but anywhere, in a community meeting, there's always a person who is against it. In other words, there's always a person, there's always that one person who just don't agree and against it. There's a story told, and I'm not race, this is not a race relations story, but years ago, back in, in Old Negro Church, there was a, a, a man by the name of John, and he's always against it. Uh, the pastor had a meeting in the church and he said it's been brought to my attention that uh, uh, we need uh, to uh, get some chandeliers for the church. Well, everybody voted for it except Brother John. And, and the pastor said, Brother John, everybody, everybody wants it. Why do you want, do not want chandeliers in the church? He said, well, Reverend, first thing, there ain't nobody in here spell it. And the second thing, there ain't nobody in here that knows how to play it. And the third thing is, we need some lights in this church. <laughs> See, people, people just sometimes uh, uh, don't understand. Maturity uh, does not relate to our age. We have all known perhaps uh, far more uh, than our parents. But uh, we have seen people in their 50s and 60s act like infants. And I've experienced people like that. Maturity involves responsibility for our actions, caring about, about someone else, 
besides ourselves and facing up to, to reality. And we don't need a, really a psychiatrist to tell us that within all of us, whatever age you might be here this morning, there lurks a little thumb-sucking, frightened, dependent child just waiting to pull us back into childishness. It's in all of us. Jesus is speaking to the religious people to whom nothing seems to suit. I, as the, the so-called religious people who had their pompous reasons, why they didn't listen to the call of God. Just as some people in this century have the so-called reasons for avoiding commitment to the Christian church, in a nutshell, Jesus was saying, no matter what the invitation may be, some will sit in the corner and sulk. People, some will not respond. This is uh, not the only time that Jesus uses sharp and cutting criticism against those two classes of religious people, uh, the lawyers and the Pharisees. But this analogy is entirely unique and a bit surprising for Jesus. If Jesus had an ideal hero in the Scripture... It was a child. But he could find no denunciation too bitter about a childishness. Childishness is, is like, is one of the most, uh, childlikeness is one of the most beautiful characteristics that a human being can have. But childishness is one of the most ugly and most repellent that a person can have. In order to illustrate how those decent, uh, cultured and scholarly gentlemen and childish gentlemen tells us this parable to show a group of joy, boys and girls who have gathered to play. Now, to play is something as natural for a child as breathing. Play to a child is certain a genuine joy. And we don't see that a whole lot anymore. Some of you are old, old enough to remember Kick the Can. Remember that? Cowboys and Indians. Red Rover, Red Rover, come right over. Hopscotch. Hide and seek. You don't see that anymore. That is childlikeness. Even though it does not concern a child, play is a means of physical and mental and moral development. If your child doesn't play, something's wrong with the child. But in the parable that Jesus tells, these children are not playing. They're angry at each other. And they're quarreling with one another. They're unhappy, unhappy individually and even adding to the unhappiness of the entire group. One group wanted to play funeral, and they said, no, that's too sad. I said, well, let's play wedding. No, I'm too glad. We just won't play at all. We're just going to fuss and be unhappy. And you know what Jesus said? He said, you religious people are just like that. What a denunciation. It was here that Jesus reminds them that a prophet of amazing power had come among them calling men to repentance, and he didn't spare any wrongdoer, whether he was a social nobody or whether he sat on the throne. You know, Herod, he condemned Herod for marrying his brother's wife. He lost his head for it. But that was a preaching of John the Baptist. Uh, John was not only stern and forbidding in his message, he, he didn't dress in style. He ate terrible food. He, did, he wasn't a good handshaker. He never invited his after-dinner speaker. He wasn't very good at pastoral visiting. And the re religious people of that day called him too harsh. They liked a man among men, 
a good mixture. They said John the Baptist was crazy. He had a demon. This is the religious people speaking. Then along came the preacher Jesus, completely opposite. He, he took all men and women to repentance, but he did it in a way that was winsome and sweet as honey. He didn't emphasize what you had to give up to enter the kingdom of God, but rather the fullness of peace and the joy that repenting would attain. He lived among men. He, he, he uh, elbowed by the crowds. He had time for lepers. He had time for prostitutes and little children. And look how he treated the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery. Uh, how unjudgmental of Zacchaeus. And Jesus was good at pastoral visiting. He was constantly going to dinner with folks in some homes where he was an honor to go, others where it was a disgrace. Some homes that he went into, he was welcome. Others he was insulted with an atmosphere of suspicion and hate. But he never refused an invitation. But what the religious people say about him, he's too common. Uh, he, uh, we don't particularly particular like him. He, he's a wine bibber. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to ask if you'll bring that, uh, if I finish this message, because I am hurting, if you bring that, uh, that uh, stand up here, that uh, musical stand, and let me sit down. I apologize for this, but I thought I could do it without any assistance, but I'm going to have to have some. Yeah, if we could just move this up here and put that right there. Let me put my notes on it there. I'm going to sit right here. I've seen Charles Stanley do this. <laughs> uh, this is good right here. Thank you. Uh, let's bring it to me. Let me put it right here. That'd be fine. Fine. Uh, they said Jesus was too social. He's a gluttonous of a man, a drunkard, a wine bibber, a friend of uh, uh, publicans and uh, sinners. The word in, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Koine Greek says he was an anthropos, uh, he was a glutton of a man. And so Jesus was saying, you accept neither John the Baptist, nor do you accept me. Uh, the question is, what was really behind the refusal to accept uh, either John or Jesus? Uh, the answer to that, I think, is they rejected uh, the counsel of God, the scribes and Pharisees, uh, for uh, their own selfish reasons. Modern psychology uses the word rationalization. Uh, once we set ourselves uh, to refuse the truth, we can always uh, find excellent reasons for objecting to objecting uh, to the possible representation of, of its arguments for it. If once we reject the truth, then I don't care how many arguments you have for it, you can find a reason to reject it. And that's what was happening among the 
religious, so-called religious people of that day, the scribes and the Pharisees, who was a, a minority among the Jewish people, and the lawyers, who were those, who the intellects, who interpret the law, who expected Jesus to say, Shemaiah, O Israel, Adonai, Elohim, Adonai, Hodeh. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and there is no other way. And so Jesus wouldn't be accepted. Sometimes we reject it even to the extent that we feel we're right. Remember Nicodemus uh, who came to Jesus at the cross who rejected him that night. Remember the apostle Paul. He was against the gospel of Jesus. He held the coats of those who stoned Stephen, the first martyr to death. He had orders to go to Damascus and bring the Christians back and assassinate them. He thought he was right, but he found out he was wrong on the road to Damascus. You know, you know the story. Uh, he was totally converted. Sadly, this childishness that I'm talking about, uh, this conservative and this liberal aspect of the gospel, has spilled over into the church, as Jesus is speaking here. It's not only what we've been experiencing in our society since this uh, pandemic, what has come out. We have seen that uh, uh, this, 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 this is very, very liberal and, and it's frightening. It's frightening for our children. For there's a, there's a false rationalization about our society today. It's, it's like, like a person uh, who, who, who uh, has lived so long that they begin to believe in uh, their own uh, ways and not the ways of others, and they believe in themselves. Now, I know that. I'm 85 years old. People who get my age sometimes believe they know everything. And that must cause them to preach longer. Sadly, this childish just did not uh, die with the, this generation to whom Jesus preached. We find it in international relationships. We find it in North Korea and China, Russia, Palestine, Israel, Hamas, and Syria, and name it on and on. What's happening in our world today? We have been bombarded with it in in politics, in the Senate and Congress, in the House, Democrats and Republicans, the Republican Party, childish is playing with the lives of people. To tell you the truth, I'm not much interested in the uh, Democratic care or the Republican care, Republican care as much as I am with the Jesus care. That's what I'm interested with. Here, Bill James Locklear used to say when I'd hear him preach where the rubber hits the highway. The sad thing, we're seeing this thing, this childishness spilling into the church with people of influence. And I agree, there's the, I'm talking about the church, not just, just church. I'm talking about the United Methodist Church. Look what's happening. And, and I agree there's a lot to criticize about the church. 
There's a lot to criticize about the local church. But what I'm trying to say, uh, how much of it is helpful and constructive? If you have a helpful word, give it. We need it. For most all churches are falling short. But if you have uh, been unwilling to anything, give anything better to offer than destructive criticism while you yourself refuse to play the game, and it's not a game, but it's, it's an analogy. Why? Chances are that your criticism is only a smoke screen to hide your own childishness. And that's what's happening in our, in our, in our conferences and the, in the international church. What lies behind this childishness that keeps us from playing the game? You, you, using that analogy, I realize that the church is no game, but let's use that analogy. Maybe some are just too spoiled to play. Therefore, if the game is not played their way, uh, if their paths are crossed, their pet views disregarded, they just want to take the ball and go home. Friends, we need to speak out. Maybe some 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 are too ch are childish uh, because of uh, of uh, they they haven't grown up. And finally, childishness may be the result of decay. Sometimes extreme old age. I mentioned it again. Brings with it. A, a, a second childhood. Scripture says that. That is tragic, but, we, but such decline is no fault of our own. But if we allow ourselves to fall into spiritual decay, it's tragic indeed, for we have no one to blame but ourselves. What is the cure for childishness, uh, the one cure, I think, is childlikeness. Uh, Naaman is one the perfect example. He, he prayed, played both, both roles. Elisha told him to dip in the Jordan River seven times to cure his leprosy, and Naaman left in a rage for two reasons. Uh, the prophet uh, did not, uh, he wanted, he, he didn't come out as, he, th he said, thought, well, the prophet would come out and call on his God and wave his hands up. He didn't do that. And death tells me to go to, to the Jordan River, which is a dirty river when it is moving. And yet there's the rivers, two rivers in Syria that are cleaner. Why am I going to do something like that? He knew a better way. The abandoned and the far rivers were much cleaner than the muddy Jordan. And so he left, taking all his goods with him. He left. Headed home with all his gifts he brought, and foolishly uh, giving up hope of finding the cure he got. And he was too childish to reel to an humble obedience to the prayers of prophet's command. It was Naaman's wise servants that showed him the silliness of his position. Uh, and at this word, the angry soldier threw away his childishness and yielded to a beautiful and humble obedience, and his flesh became the flesh of a little child. And there shone in his face something of an inner beauty that he had in his heart. Friends, that's what we need today. We need to relate to each other and to the Lord Jesus that someone can see uh, not only in our smile, uh, not, but, but they can see the 
inner beauty of what we really have in our heart. Uh, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about empathy. That's a beautiful word. It means to get on in somebody, on the inside of someone, to have empathy with them. We need to get on the inside of each other as we get on the inside of Jesus and the church. I know there's not but a few of you here. I realize that, but that's enough. More than Jesus had as he began. Where do we stand? Uh, where do you stand? Are, are you playing the game or criticizing others? I don't think so here. Or are you living uh, your share of the Lord or adding to the already uh, overburdened shoulders of others? Are you entering God's purpose for your life or are you thwarting God's purpose for your life? You have to, you have to investigate your life. You think it were the Lord to speak his, his mind about you and me, what would he say as you sit in the pew? What, are 20, about 20 of us here? If he would come like he did on the day of Pentecost, my, perhaps without the rock, without the wind, without the tongues, but if he would come and, and, and permeate this, this few 20 people here right now, what would he have to say about you, about me? No one can answer that question but you. But this we must realize, it is truly as we play the game for the purpose of Christ that we can finally be saved. Just answer his call. We can have faith, but Paul said to us that faith without actions or faith without love is dead. We have to, we have to demonstrate that. If you would like, like God to take away your childishness this morning and help you to treat others with the same tenderness and sensitivity and, and loving kindness that Jesus did, then as you sit in your pew, tell him so. Show him so. difficult, not popular sermon. Why do I, I preach it in this way? There's one reason. A father once said to a young man, why, what, what reason do you have to marry my daughter? And he said, I have no reason. I'm in love. We don't have to have a rationalization. We can be in love with Christ, in love with God, and let him demonstrate himself through us, love and kindness and care. You can do it in many ways. I find the way I uh, shared with Todd, I found a way uh, to do it that pleases me. You remember Todd, I told you about giving the money. And you was talking about you gave some money to feed someone. This church gave me $100 last time I preached here. I said, I, I don't want to receive any money, but if you give it to me, I'm going to give it away. A young black boy rolled my carton out to our food line uh, Friday, put my groceries in the van. And I said, I know that you're not supposed to give tips in the food line, but I'm going to give you one because the Lord told me to give it to you, and I'm more obedient to the Lord than I am what food line has to say. And I gave him a $50 bill. 
That was part of the money. That was half of the money his church gave me. I saw it in his eyes. I felt it in his heart. And I said, son, if Jesus were not real and if Jesus did not love you, I would not give this to you. It's because I feel it in my heart. So many ways. That's a minute way that we can be de demonstrative of God's love in our hearts and let people know what our decision is. Please do so. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
grace of God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you, not only this moment, but every day of your life. Amen.